Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You. My name's Charles Kennedy and tonight I'm in charge. People of Britain, get used to it. <laughs> in the news this week, during a royal visit to a warship, the captain regrets letting Prince Philip have a go in the machine gun. <laughs> and at a doctor's surgery in Westminster, a documentary team is given surprising access to a routine medical. <laughs> On Ian's team is television scientist Robert Winston. I'm with Paul tonight, an author and journalist who has accused the BBC of dumbing down. Please welcome Jordan's teammate on Shooting Stars, <laughs> Will Self. <laughs> and we start with round one. Paul and Will, what's all this about? This is the speech this week, wasn't it, Cherie Blair? Um, that's Peter Foster. That's the Blairs on disguise going on holiday. <laughs> yes. What's the Australian connection? Um, I think that's where he's been deported to, isn't it? Yeah, it's because of retro punishment, really. Transportation, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Australia. Everything's retro yeah. nowadays. Well, well, I thought the speech was going well until she brought out that onion. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's... Just sort of lost it for me. Let's just remind ourselves of that famous speech. And particularly my son in his first term at university, living away from home. You'd have to have a heart of stone not to laugh. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's, a t it's a tough place for a young lad, Bristol. And nowhere to live except two flats. Yeah. <laughs> it's the tough life. I don't suppose there was any serious news this week, wasn't there, actually, Charles? Is that a Labour peer what? talking <laughs> on my <laughs> left? <laughs> how, how did you feel about it? I think it's finished, isn't it? Oh, no, it's still going. <laughs> now, that, that's the classic New Labour line. As soon as a new discovery comes up, they say, well, let's, uh, let's uh, move on, it's all over. <laughs> but I don't think it is. <laughs> Do you know who advised us to actually make the speech? Ken Dodd. No. <laughs> Ken Dodd. I thought it was. No, it was not Ken Dodd. I, I think, think it was Peter Close, close. Peter Mandelson and the Diddy Men. It was, it was Peter Mandelson and... Yeah, he, he, he's pretty good on those property deals, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was it Cherie said that she wasn't in that speech? Uh, she said, I'm not Shirley Bassey. No, did you say that? She did, Charles. She didn't. <laughs> she did. I listened to it carefully. She I listened not. to it more carefully than you did. <laughs> she said... She said, I'm not superwoman. She yes. said, I'm not superwoman. And she said, you know, us working mums, <laughs> hey, we all lie. <laughs> <laughs> say that. That was, that was the subtext. Here's a good memory one for you. Yep. Back in July 1998... Brotherhood of Man. Uh, <laughs> we may have been on the go then, but so was somebody else. What did Tony Blair tell the nation at that point? I love being asked this by a senior politician. <laughs> as though you don't know. Um, <laughs> let's have a look. Yeah. I think we have to be very careful with people fluttering around the new government, trying to make all sorts of claims of influence, that we are pure and pure, that people understand that we will not have any truck with anything that is improper in any shape or form at all. So there you are. There's an element Simon. here of her being conned by this guy, though, as well, isn't there? What, by Blair? Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're all being conned by him. <laughs> of course, the Cherie Blair saga. The row all centres on Downing Street and a seven-storey block of flats. The first story was that Cherie had never met Peter Foster. <laughs> of course, Cherie's lifestyle guru, Carol Kaplan, has an equally gifted mother. According to the Mail, Sylvia Kaplan is a spiritualist who can open channels with the dead. Apparently, she's in regular contact with the Conservative Party. <laughs> How do you think this is going to go down with your colleagues in Parliament? <laughs> Not with my ones in the Conservative Party. No. I think this is the end of the Lib Lab Pact. <laughs> it could be the end of a lot more than that. <laughs> the programme is out. Ian and Robert, your turn. This is the story about Michael Hesselstein challenging for the leadership of the Labour of the <laughs> Party. <laughs> Challenging for the, uh, le the uh, leader of the uh, official opposition. 
Um, because I, I thought that was Charles. Because, well, I mean, we'll come back to that in a second. <laughs> but how did Ken Clark respond to his suggestion? He said, of course I'd like to be Prime Minister. I think Ken Clark would like to be Prime Minister of Burma. <laughs> <laughs> I believe he has extensive interest. And he's so keen on becoming leader, last time there was a contest, he was in Vietnam selling fags. Yeah. He's yeah. in a little yeah. kiosk, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Were you there at question time this week? I was, yes, I was asking some questions. Did you feel that he made a big impact? Um, who? <laughs> Don't <laughs> Don't we ever feel like getting there early and seeing where he's sitting? <laughs> I was turned up late. You could take him, you could take him, Charles. Think so? Yeah, absolutely. I think you could, don't you? <laughs> oh, I think I could. Yeah. Okay, there we are, there's your headline. Charles <laughs> Kennedy wants to attack Ian Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> Get in there, Get in there, Ian. Well, there's a great description of Michael Heseltine as a serial killer. He just can't see someone's back without getting a knife and <laughs> shit straight in it. Yes, Michael Heseltine's very helpful call for the Tories to drop Ian Duncan Smith and replace him with Ken Clark. According to one Ken Clark supporter, unless drastic action is taken, the Tory party faces slipping down to number three behind the Liberal Democrats. Of course, that assumes the Liberal Democrat leader doesn't go and do anything stupid. <laughs> Despite retiring as an MP after two heart attacks, Michael Heseltine is still a formidable opponent. But Ian Duncan Smith insists there's no hard feelings. He's even invited him round for a fry up and a game of squash. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, Will, what's happening here? Uh, this is the dossier, I think, the dossier that's been coming out of Iraq. The 12, yeah, 12, it's on CD page. already, you see. <laughs> <laughs> Make it fit for the Christmas number one. <laughs> <laughs> It's the most important person in the United Nations there operating the photocopier machine. And why, why did the Americans whisk it off to photocopy it? Well, uh, because they rule the planet. Yeah. And uh, they're that in control that was, of everything. That, that they rule you. That You're controlled by wires from the Pentagon. You didn't know that, did you? No, yeah, I can no, see them. No. <laughs> they claimed they had the best photocopiers. Really? <laughs> <laughs> What do the United Nations have? Just a bloke with a blackboard and a pen and tracing papers. <laughs> Which country were they most worried about seeing a copy of this? Syria. And they've never sold any arms to Syria, and of course, nor have we. Ever. <laughs> do you know that Saddam has nine doubles, and one of them is sitting next to me? <laughs> <laughs> Away from that in Washington this week, what, in fact, has been taking up most of President Bush's time? Send it out Christmas cards. He sent out a million Christmas cards. He did? He did. He licked them all himself. He did. <laughs> he had to, because he kept spelling Christmas wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, there it is. <laughs> Does Bush play the piano? Yes, he's a brilliant concert pianist. <laughs> a career tragically cut short by becoming president of America. <laughs> he studied the piano for several years before realising it was a large musical instrument. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of any possible military action coming up, why will our HMS Nottingham be unlikely to be involved in It's a pub. <laughs> It's that uh, ship that ran onto the rocks, isn't it, uh, off it is. Australia? And it was brought home on the deck of a sort of salvage vessel. Yeah. Just hope that's not the entire Royal Navy and the small one at the front there. But <laughs> I had a nuclear submarine that collided with the Isle of Skye a few weeks ago. If the Isle of Skye will insist on shooting around the Irish Sea like that... <laughs> The release of the Iraqi arms declaration is unlikely that George Bush will attempt to read the 12,000 page document himself, as there's a serious risk that the end of his finger would wear away. <laughs> what, what happens if you become Prime Minister and he rings up? <laughs> it's unlikely that he would ring up. Uh, <laughs> Ian and Robert, can you make sense of this? This is a 200 pound elephant baby that's just been born as a result of um, insemination. And it was Thomas Hildebrand, a German expert, who inseminated the elephant because. <laughs> Are you telling us you didn't have a hand in it? No. no. <laughs> How big a turkey baster do you have to use for an elephant? <laughs> you just use the whole turkey, don't the you? The story was that this, this um, rather like you, Charles, is. The elephant was very strong and drinking well. 
You mean it was drunk? Well, it's... it's... You mean this German man got the elephant drunk first? <laughs> and then took advantage of it? <laughs> I thought Mr Blunkett had laws against that. He better watch out, because if he doesn't phone or he doesn't write, elephants <laughs> never forget, so... <laughs> Have you seen the photos of this baby elephant inside the womb? Yes, and it looks just yes, like a baby elephant. <laughs> yes. There's a little ultrasound picture, isn't there? Which was there it is. There it is. There it is. Actually, it transpires this photograph was from the Daily Mail. It turns out that this wasn't the elephant in question, which was born in Colchester at the zoo there. This is its brother that was born in Vienna. But there we are. Never right. think you'd read anything inaccurate in the Daily Mail, would you? <laughs> <laughs> Is it the same process? What? Elephant IVF and, and your particular field. Presumably you don't use a stepladder. We do treat yes. <laughs> This isn't Tembo's first experience of fatherhood. According to the Daily Mail, Tembo has also mated naturally with a female at Colchester Zoo called Zola. She works in the souvenir kiosk. <laughs> And at the end of that round, a quick look at the scores shows us that Ian and Robert are on five, while Paul and Will are on four. Oh. Yeah. For the tabloid headline round, Paul and Santa Slade. Yeah. This is a story about the priest that uh, made the extraordinary assertion to a bunch of children that Santa Claus doesn't exist. And of course, he was completely wrong because Father Christmas does exist. <laughs> yeah. There was a bit of science behind this. <laughs> <laughs> I can't measure Father Christmas in scientific terms because he's beyond the, the simple imaginations of scientists. So but that's the thing scientists never take into account, isn't never, it? He's never. magic. Yeah. The guy was a substitute priest, and, mm. and after he freaked out all of these three-year-olds, uh, he explained that he had no idea how old they are, which is what priests often say, of course. <laughs> 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 he was one of the priests. Oh, Eureka. Oh, Eureka. Yeah. Like... And Eureka's response to this uh, outburst from the pulpit about Santa. Didn't yeah. she write a book about it and name the priest? <laughs> Sure, the smart Christmas is going to be bringing you for Christmas this year, Charles. Oh, yeah. proportional represent. <laughs> Church of England's also been in controversy this week. Have you seen this? Another story? Blessed are the holy tat sellers. Oh, no, it's a website which it offers really tacky religious and Christmas gifts. We can have a look at some of these. Oh, right. There's a bobble-headed nodding Jesus. <laughs> That's Robin Cook. Yes. <laughs> Standing on a cow pan. Yeah. <laughs> then, if it's your wish, you can have a Father, Son and Holy Ghost. <laughs> in... Uh, in Lego. In Lego. <laughs> in Lego. That is unbelievable. <laughs> this is a thousand years then... of theology and it looks like Casper. <laughs> If you really feel like splashing out this Christmas, there's a 47-foot inflatable cathedral. Oh, <laughs> it it comes with a blow-up altar, pulpit and pews. No, no. How much would that set you back, you think? That's got to be worth 180 quid. Yeah, 180 quid are up. Steve, isn't it? Still, you wouldn't need to grow that Leylandi hedge. neighbours next door. Just erect your inflatable cathedral. That'll freak them out. Yeah. Would you buy one, Charles? No. Why not? Too mean. You're too mean. Too mean. You're too mean to buy an inflatable cathedral. Yes. Well, you're not getting my vote. Yeah. <laughs> Ian and Robert, wake me up before you go go. This is about trains. Subject close oh, yes. to your heart. They've decided this Christmas because a lot of people go to Christmas parties and fall asleep on trains and then miss their station. Oh. Yeah. So they're issuing badges that says wake me up yes, at, yes, you know, yes. at, Bruton. at Bruton or Marden or Ashford. <laughs> Except on my line. Um, where they're issuing badges saying, wake me up if a train arrives at all. <laughs> There's a marvellous chart of a practical joker. You only just have to go around with all these pissed people, take off their signs and badges and just put Dover. <laughs> <laughs> with the party season on, uh, newspapers are beginning to come out with the seasonal advice about hangover cures and all that. Robert, do you have one? You're a medical man. Yes, of course. Um, keep, keep your alcohol, your blood alcohol, well above 80 milligrams the whole time, and then you won't have any. That's... <clears throat>
Uh, so, uh, Have you got any advice for dealing with cirrhosis? Or, uh... <laughs> you don't get cirrhosis with good malt whiskey, do you, Charles? Certainly not. Certainly Is not. that right? Yeah. You sound very reformed there. No, I am very reformed. I'm very reformed. And the Daily Mirror, it's been running some unorthodox... Well, and the Daily Mirror's been running some... I can hear that malt whiskey at work. <laughs> If you get pissed on the whiskey, don't go to a zoo, you'll end up being the father of an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> Every year, we issue these warnings to have you, have you seen some of these unorthodox hangover cues? If you are going to have mirror? sex with an elephant, use an inflatable cathedral as a condom. <laughs> <laughs> you know well, it makes sense. One way is rubbing lemon under your arm. What are we talking about now? <laughs> Apparently, that's a much favoured Puerto Rico hangover cure. Company. How many fingers am yeah. I holding up? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're holding them that way. <laughs> it's the latest raft of proposals to improve the train services. Train operator First Great Eastern has started handing out Wake Me Up When We Get to My Stop badges. The first batch were eagerly snapped up by the train drivers. <laughs> This week, Connex South Eastern received an unexpected bonus of £58 million. Someone bought an open return to Gillingham. <laughs> and at the end of all that, the scores have moved on to Ian and Robert with eight points, Paul and Will with seven. <laughs> Round three is all about picking the odd one out. Paul and Will, your four are Sir Ranulph Twistled and Wickham Fines, Lord Melvin Bragg, Edwina Curry, and Alan Titchmarsh. That's Melvin Bragg, is it? That is a younger Melvin the Bragg. The fifth Beatle. Um, <laughs> I like the way that Alan Titchmarsh is parting those fronds. Yes, and I think you'll find that next to him, those are John Major's hands. <laughs> I think that uh, Titchmarch writes these novels, right, yeah. as well as being a sort of top garden bloke. Mm. Curry writes these sort of parliamentary bonk busters, in which you've featured in a cameo, haven't you? <laughs> Not that I was aware Yes, you have, as a, a highly sexed, mm. flame-topped Scotsman. There was something of the elephant house about the way he mm. wandered towards me. <laughs> Is that your trunk, or are you just pleased to see them? <laughs> I must admit, I do recognise that description, Will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, this is about the bad David sex award. So, ah, yes, maybe it's there's a, about There's an yes. award every year yeah. given ah. to the novelists who write most cringingly about sex. Won't you, won't you in which case, have they all won it except... Except Reynolds Fison, he's no, won it. Because his penis fell off when he went to the Norfolk Pole. <laughs> <laughs> Frozen. The Norfolk Pole? The Norfolk Pole. He, got, he was wandering around the arm of saying, I declare this land is British. I just outside think... the co-op. And it was a cold snap in every sense of the word. <laughs> well, they've all been nominated for yeah. the Bad Sex and Fiction Award, mm. except for Fines. Oh, right. mm. But he starred as a metaphor in last year's winning entry. Oh, really? Her hand is moving away from my knee and heading north heading unnervingly and with a steely will towards the pole. And like Sir Ranulph Fiennes, Pamela will not easily be discouraged. And when she reaches the North Pole, I think in wonder and terror, she will surely want to pitch her tent. <laughs> and like... the Norwegians got their first. Like, and... <laughs> and of course, Will, you've been nominated this year, haven't you? Yeah. A passage in your own novel. Did you not win? Unfortunately not. I'm gutted. <laughs> really gutted. Well, nonetheless, they were like two flamingos, mm. each attempting to filter the nutriment out of the other with sharp slurps of their muscular tongues. Well, you know, flamingo, of course, is a filter feeder. Not a lot of people know that. Mm. It's got that. That's why flamingos' tongues were such a great delicacy in ancient Rome. They're a great big fat thing that they use like a suction pump to draw microorganisms through their beef. Mm. Now you've explained it, that's terribly good. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but they, 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 they don't have a penis, flamingos, do they? Oh, dear, the you whole thing's need... fallen apart. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need one with a tongue like that. Yeah. <laughs> Alan Titchmarsh told the journalist, in 1998, 
I suddenly knew I had an imagination <laughs> which I'd never used. I don't know where my ideas come from. The lead character in my first book was a television character. <laughs> it's a gift, I suppose. <laughs> According to the Daily Record, Alan Titchmarsh's first three novels have all been bestsellers and Shift by the Bucket Load. <laughs> Spot the misprint. <laughs> <laughs> Ian and Robert, your famous five. Cleopatra, Ainsley from Fame Academy, Tony and Cherie again, and a hippopotamus. Well, they've all bought flats. <laughs> We've got this uh, salle de bain attitude towards yeah. this. We think it's mm. all about the bathroom. Cleopatra, famous for ass's milk yep. lathing. Mm. Yep. Cherie, uh, famous for having those toxins rubbed off by Carol Kaplan in, Carol the, Kaplan. in, in the uh, shower. Hippo, with mud. Hippo loves mud to wallow baths. in mud. Mud, mud baths. Uh, mud baths, and, and I don't really know anything we about We don't know anything about They don't wash at but all. We say they've, all one out. they've all enjoyed mud baths, yeah. apart from Cleopatra, oh, who, of course, right. famously enjoyed right. bathing in milk. She <laughs> used crocodile dung as a contraceptive as well. Well, well no one to go near her once she was smeared with that. Cleopatra, give it a rest, will you? Well, I want to know the source of this Cleopatra story. Well, the crocodile dung. The croc have you oh, just made that up? No, it's in the papyruses. I mean, it is, really. Right, the daily papyrus. <laughs> papyrus. <laughs> <laughs> Where did uh, Tony and Shiri enjoy their mud bath together? Uh, Bournemouth. Yeah, Acapulco. Yeah, yeah. What did they experience? Mud. A primal <laughs> rebirth. Mm. And then Tony made a wish. Do you know what he wished for? A proper opposition. Yeah, a proper opposition. <laughs> well, he wished for world peace, actually. World peace. Well, that, why, why is he uh, sending large numbers of his <laughs> troops uh, uh, into the Middle East to destabilise it, then? Surely he must be schizophrenic. Yeah. <laughs> what a frightening thought. You're not schizophrenic, are you? Because you haven't got my vote if you are. I'm in two minds about it. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> Tony and Cherie smeared each other with mud, watermelon and papaya in a hut during a rebirthing ceremony in Mexico. Then, according to the observer, there was a primal scream of agony. <laughs> Apparently, Peter Mandelson was having a Brazilian fruit facial in the next hut along. <laughs> in an interview with Hello! magazine, Ainsley criticised the Fame Academy voting system. It's such a hideous thing to do. You have to knife your friends in the back to succeed. Sounds fair enough to me. <laughs> Can I just tell them that Fame Academy is a, a, a popular television show? Because well, they may not know that. As we're obviously recording this before the live finals, but by the time this show goes out on Friday, it'll be down to the last two, which I reckon will be Sinead and David, which I reckon will be Sinead and Lamar. Which I reckon will be David and Lamar. <laughs> of course, by the time of the Saturday repeat, we'll know the winner. My money's on Sinead. My money's on David. My money's on Lamar. Is this what's called proportional representation? <laughs> Everyone's a winner. Everyone's a winner. Missing Words is the final round featuring this week's guest publication, Piping Times. <laughs> Here we go. Mr. Angry is what? On tranquilizers. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Angry is heading for a cardiac arrest. More at risk of a heart Thank attack. You. Oh, I don't believe yeah. it. This is the medical. <laughs> <laughs> Next, the McCallum drone valve is not suitable for uh, what? Firing a Scud missile. <laughs> the marching bagpipe. No, it is a bagpipe. It one, is a bagpipe. Is it? It's got to be. The McCallum yes. drone valve was one of the great in innovations, wasn't it, in 1678? <laughs> On the drone valve, bagpipes sounded, you know, remarkably like any other wind yeah. instrument. The only, the only way they could simulate the sound of the bagpipes in those days was the scalds and cats in hot water. <laughs> <laughs> Callum drone valve, and he thought the cats are safe. You're all doing very well, but not quite well enough. The answer is. Mozart? <laughs> the answer is use in skin bags. <laughs> Next, will Blair back what? Into this shower stall while I apply some mud to his nether regions. <laughs> Says Hippo. Says Hippo. Yes. This is uh, back the Olympic bid for London. Absolutely correct, Paul. Olympic bid. 
Well, yeah. if he does, Cherie's for the high jumper. Yeah. <laughs> well, perhaps I think, uh, Charles, you should represent Britain at the Olympic level. Have you ever been uh, tempted to? Have you been asked to actually represent this country? I think you should. No, I haven't yet. I've got, I've got no, to say I'm, that. I'm just wondering if there's any example of sporting <laughs> prowess. <laughs> Next. I Can we see that bit of footage again, please? <laughs> is this slow motion or is this real time? <laughs> Look, I was concentrating. I was concentrating. What? Where are you what? concentrating on? That was just... That is that, was just, is that, is that, that was what they call the... curling, Charles? No, that wasn't curling. That's no. toe curling. It's what goes around the that was just the warm-up. So that, you had another go after that? That was, that was called going for the sympathy vote. OK. So let's have a look at the other go that you had after that. <laughs> And finally, I haven't got a political message, I just... Appear on Have A Good News for you as chairman. <laughs> what are we going to have next? Ian Duncan Smith and they think it's all over. It is now, yes. That's what said, the answer, in fact, is want people to feel better. This is oh. about Nikki Page. She wants to be the Tory candidate for Mayor of London. Oh, yes. The yes, attractive yes. blonde, former model, is standing against Stephen Norris. He'll be pleased with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that brings us to the end of tonight's contest. And the final scores are as follows. Ian and Robert come in with 10 points, oh. but Paul and Will win with 11. Oh. I leave you with news that there are fresh allegations of thieving at the palace as Prince Charles's wallet goes missing. <laughs> <laughs> at the National Gallery, just when he thinks things can't get any worse, Ian Duncan Smith unveils his new portrait. <laughs> uh, and there are mass resignations at the Downing Street press office as a new scandal threatens to break. <laughs> Good night. It's Jeremy Clarkson's turn to take the reins in the next edition of Have I Got News For You, coming up in just a few moments here on UK TV Documentary.